wins the breakthrough. Clive Allen finds Chris Waddle. And it's Nico Klassen who puts Tottenham ahead. A splendid shot. One nil to Spurs. Gary Stevens was wearing the number 10 shirt in the absence of Glenn Hoddle. And Ian Andrews in the Leicester goal was having a very busy night. Good play again by Steve Hodge. Stevens touches the ball on to Waddle. Hodge's cross. A volley by Mavitt. Appeals for handball, waved away. But the Spurs attack is relentless. Paul Allen to Klassen. Paul Allen again. A diving header by Hodge. Eventually, Leicester had to crack. Hodge now in the second half. That was Stevens. Thomas. In goes Paul Allen, and goalkeeper Andrews brings him down. Yet another penalty to Tottenham. spot as usual increasing Spurs lead to 2-0 and there was plenty more to come this time Paul Allen scores involved in the build-up again. So too is Klassen. And inevitably, the man on the end of it, Clive Allen. That made it Swaddle away on the left for Tottenham. And a fine save by the goalkeeper who had to change direction to meet the deflection. attack but at this stage in the game they were hardly going to disturb Tottenham's superiority Spurs simply went out and got number five 
By now, the match had turned into a superb personal performance for Paul Allen. In the course of 13 minutes, he had a hand in four goals. He put Nico Klassen away there, and the shot dropped between the goalkeeper and the near post. Spurs 5, Leicester City 0. Could Spurs go one better and beat their total against West Ham? Certainly, Paul Allen was still very much involved. And so was Klassen. All in all, an easy win for Spurs. count the passes in this move but Andrew has denied Chris Waddle the luxury of goal number six <laughs> Leicester were torn apart notably by Waddle Back now to the Littlewoods Cup. Spurs had beaten Arsenal 1-0 at Highbury in the first leg of the semi-final. And 37,000 were here at White Hart Lane for the return. Arsenal, encouraged by their success here in the league two months earlier, went close early on. But after 16 minutes, a mistake by their goalkeeper John Lukic allowed Spurs to increase their aggregate lead. He fumbled Richard Goff's free kick and allowed Clive Allen to swoop for his 38th goal of the season. Surely now, Spurs were on their way to Wembley. They should have been. One attack piled on another in that first half but David Pleat's team seemed destined never to quite break the back of Arsenal's resistance, even though it was precarious at times. The Gunners were under heavy artillery. But their defence wobbled without collapsing. When, just before half-time, David Rowcastle went close, the warning lights began flashing for Spurs. Even so, early in the second half, before a live television audience, Tottenham should really have sewn up the tie. It seems churlish to blame Clive Allen, of all people, for missing a good chance. But it did prove costly. Almost at once, at the other end, following an Arsenal throw-in near the corner flag, Viv Anderson squeezed the equaliser in at the near post. 1-1 one, one on the day, but Arsenal is still one behind on aggregate. Not for long. Niall Quinn starts the move by playing the ball to Paul Davis. Out it goes to Rowcastle, and look who's on the far post. Quinn again to turn the ball in and level the aggregate at two goals each. Now it's extra time. Even then, Spurs might have won it. 
Substitute Tony Galvin's lob beats the keeper that's headed out from underneath the crossbar by David O'Leary. Spurs won the toss to stage the decisive third match at White Hart Lane just three days later. This time Arsenal, themselves tilting at three trophies, made the better start. And that man Quinn caused Spurs' hearts to miss a beat again. It soon developed into another epic cup tie. And Nico Klassen was mighty close for Spurs. The game ebbed and flowed between the two North London rivals. Tottenham generally were having the better of things. And at the end of this move, Chris Waddle missed a chance which on reflection should have gone in. After 62 minutes, Clive Allen completed a quite remarkable hat-trick. For the third time in these semi-final matches, he put Spurs ahead in the game. It followed a free kick on the Tottenham right, lofted in by Ozzy Ardiles. Richard Goff won the ball in the air, and Alan pounced to set a record of 12 goals in the Littlewoods Cup in one season. Spurs were still leading from that goal until seven minutes from the end. Then the match took a completely unexpected late turn. Arsenal had made a substitution, taking off Charlie Nicholas and replacing him with Ian Allenson. And it was his work on the left-hand side that undid all that Tottenham had achieved earlier. First of all, Allenson surprised Clements at the near post. And for Tottenham, worse was to follow. David O'Leary's free kick broke first to Allenson and then to Rowcastle. And Arsenal were on their way to Wembley. In the league, Liverpool came to White Hart Lane at the end of March, having won 10 and drawn two of their last 12 matches to take a commanding lead in the Championship. They were nearly in the lead there through Paul Walsh. Spurs were fourth at this stage and had to win here to keep up their title hopes. Again before a live television audience, it was the artistry of Chris Waddle on Tottenham's right that was to prove decisive. One of his typical tantalising runs ended with him beating Bruce Grobelaar with a bouncing shot. A year earlier, also on live television, Waddle had put Spurs ahead in this fixture only to find Liverpool staging a second-half recovery which won them the game in the very last minute. This year, it was going to be different because Spurs had the better of things after the break. In a number of well-directed attacks, Tottenham might have increased their lead.
David Pleat was persevering with his five-man midfield and it worked against the Liverpool side whose last defeat in the league had been three months earlier on Boxing Day. Indeed, Spurs' victory here was a turning point in the Championship in 1986-87 because Liverpool lost their next two matches against Wimbledon and Norwich and they were eventually overtaken by neighbours Everton who went on to win the title. Spurs' best chance seemed to be third place and they moved there permanently when Paul Miller and his new club Charlton came to White Hart Lane in April. Nico Klassen made an early chance for Steve Hodge. Glenn Hoddle's Tottenham career was drawing towards a close and he seemed determined to go out on a high note. Just a week earlier, Spurs had beaten Watford 4-1 at Villa Park in the FA Cup semi-final. So, with a place at Wembley now assured, the 28,000 crowd were in high spirits in a match which produced only one goal. Bob Boulder made a fine save from Paul Allen to delay the inevitable. But it finally came a minute before half-time. And the build-up to the goal showed again what progress Steve Hodge had made down Tottenham's left flank. A nice little cross and Clive Allen scores easily. His 46th goal of the season. And now, Clive had overtaken the original Tottenham scoring record of Jimmy Greaves. In the second half, Spurs should really have had more goals. They certainly had all the play, and Paul Miller and the Charlton defenders were stretched time and time again. They had goalkeeper Boulder to thank for some fine saves. That one from Nico Klassen. Paul Allen again working overtime in midfield. And at the end of the next Tottenham attack, it was Steve Hodge who tested the goalkeeper. And finally, Paul Allen put the ball over the bar. Charlton weren't having much luck either in their few and far between attacks. This was Ralph Milne with a shot, beautifully saved by Ray Clements. So... Another team fighting relegation were Oxford United, who had sold their top scorer John Aldridge to Liverpool and were trying to avoid being involved in the playoffs between clubs from the bottom of the first division and the top of the second. Not that that concerned Tottenham. Spurs had won 4-2 at the Manor Ground earlier in the season and were looking here to move up to full throttle in time for the FA Cup final at Wembley when their opponents would be Coventry City. The match got off to a fairly slow start. But when Spurs warmed up, they played some nice football. It took Tottenham ten minutes to take the lead. And when the goal came, the man who found a way through was Steve Hodge, now showing his England quality on Spurs' left flank. His cross and a crisp header into the corner by Chris Waddle. Two of David Pleat's 5-9 midfield combining sweeping. 
five minutes later, more close understanding between the Allens. Clive paves the way, and Paul picks up a most deserved reward. 2-0 to Spurs, and Oxford's defence in trouble. But from this Oxford corner, a rare mistake by Ray Clements allowed Dean Saunders to force the ball home of Chris Hewton. 26 minutes gone, Spurs 2, Oxford 1. Glenn Hoddle was looking to go out in style. He clipped the bar in the first half, and in this, his penultimate home performance, he was keen to get among the scorers. Mind you, so too was Clive Allen. Now in the second half, his total for the season was 47, and he was striving to reach the half century before he ran out of games. As the second half wore on, it was clear that several Spurs players were trying to enhance their claim for cup final places. One of them was right back Chris Hewton, who would soon come under challenge for the number two shirt from the fit again Gary Stevens. Crosses like that were doing Hewton's case no harm at all. Chris Waddle, who won over so many Spurs fans during the season, continued to delight them. And after he had hit the bar, Goalkeeper Peter Hucker saved well from Steve Hodge. Then in the last minute, as an Oxford attack broke down, it happened. Glenn Hoddle's last goal for Tottenham, and what a treat it was. lavish, lasting memory for Spurs fans as Glenn set off for a new life in Monaco. On the morning of the Maybank holiday, Manchester United were the visitors to White Hart Lane. Under new manager Alex Ferguson, United were really building for next season. They lay a modest 11th in the first division, as against Spurs' third place. But the great crowd pullers still drew 37,000 people who saw Paul Allen go close there after bursting through midfield. At the other end, John Sieverbeck's cross found Norman Whiteside, but Ray Clements was as alert as ever. And a few minutes later, the experienced goalkeeper's reflexes were tested again by the same player. But the Spurs defender, who had more reason to remember this match even than Clements, was left-back Mitchell Thomas. He had shown several times during the season already a happy knack of arriving in the opposing penalty area at the right time. So, when Chris Waddle crossed from the right, it was no surprise to find Mitchell on the spot to put Spurs ahead after half an hour. United vainly appealing for offside. In the second half, it was nearly all Tottenham as United defended frantically. Ball pass by Paul McGrath, intercepted by Chris Waddle. And a push by John Sieverbeck on Steve Hodge means a penalty to Spurs. Afterwards, Alex Ferguson blamed his side for what he called a pathetic display. There were no such worries for David Pleat, nor indeed for Clive Allen, given the opportunity here from yet another penalty to take his total for the season to 48. Spurs now were in full cry, and United were pulled first one way and then the other. Again, 
Mitchell Thomas, at the top of your picture, took the opportunity to move forward to join the attack, which was built up on the other side by Chris Waddle. Paul Allen's cross. This time, Thomas hits the post. Little was seen of the Manchester United attack, and Brian Robson's midfield was overrun. Gary Walsh, in goal, was working overtime. Spurs continued to move sweetly, but when the third goal came after 63 minutes, it was certainly one of the cheekiest seen at White Hart Lane during the season. Watch for Mitchell Thomas and the overhead kick. Three nil to Spurs. Not surprisingly, Mitchell is now a leading contender for man of the match. And he helped create the fourth goal after 74 minutes. Clive Allen went goal hunting again, but it was Cousin Paul who applied the finishing touch to inflict on United their heaviest defeat of the season. Spurs 4, Manchester United 0. And it seemed then as though Tottenham were in good heart for the FA Cup final against Coventry. So what conclusions can we draw from these home highlights of 1986-87? Many Spurs followers called it a nearly year. Tottenham were third in the...